Hi guys, welcome back to our channel, the number one place for people who love design, art and all things creative. It's Jacqueline here and this is part three in our design travel series. During July, Laszlo and I went to the south of France and also met up with my parents and we thought we'd show you what we got up to on our travels and all the cool architecture and design we saw along the way. I've been lucky enough to visit France many times growing up, but my family and I would usually go to the Pays de la Loire region, so this was actually the first time I've been to the south of France and it was so interesting to see how different the architecture and surroundings change as you travel further south of the country. Which may sound completely normal if you live in such a vast country like America, however here in the UK, especially England, the architecture doesn't change that much when you travel to another part of the country. Like I said before, we actually met my parents there and the whole point of the holiday was to do a big south of France road trip because we've always wanted to do it and we thought that in order to see the different towns, a car journey would be the best way to explore the regions. So our French journey started in the famous region of Provence, which is actually divided into six departments. We started off in the Alpes Maritime and Var area, which includes the glamorous French Riviera, then travelled north to explore the valleys of the Alps in the Alpes de Haute Provence district, next travelled down to the Bouche du Rhône to explore the quintessential Provençal town of Aix, and finally moved north out of Provence towards the southwest, ending up in the medieval Dordogne department. From London, it was a two hour flight to Nice Airport, which was very quick, and because it was an evening flight, we planned to start exploring the region the next morning. If you're thinking of travelling there, just know that there are many towns to visit in Provence and also in the French Riviera. We even stopped in Italy for a pizza because it was so close and I think it's definitely worth travelling to these towns because they all have their own unique attractions and architecture. But we had no idea just how many small towns were worth visiting and our host actually recommended specific towns that we hadn't even heard of before. So make sure to leave room in your itinerary for those places whilst on your visit because they are truly beautiful. Provence is located in the southeast of France and is of course known for its glamour along the Côte d'Azur and hilltop Provençal villages that overlook the vast Alps mountain range. Along the French Riviera, the coastline is saturated with first-class hotels, restaurants, chic boutiques, private beaches and luxury houses, mainly in the cities of Nice, Cannes and of course the municipality of Monaco too. This area is extremely chic and glitzy and there's a reason it's renowned for being a second home to movie stars. However, the rusticity of the region becomes clear when driving amongst the golden olive groves in the hills and exploring countryside towns. In particular, we loved the Fréjus and saint Raphael area because of the Massif de l'Estral mountain range, famous for its rugged red rocks. It was just a really beautiful place and the towns were less flashy than the others along the Riviera, so it kind of gives you a taste of both the glamorous and rustic sides of the region. Now, the Côte d'Azur is synonymous with art, architecture, amazing food, and is just an all-round inspiring melting pot of culture, which is why more than 13 million tourists visit here every year. Whilst we were in the Côte d'Azur, I was surprised at how different the towns we visited were from one another. The architectural contrasts hit you in the face. The mixture of architecture is due to the many different countries that have occupied the area over the years. Provence was inhabited by Ligure since Neolithic times, by the Celtic since about 900 BC, and the Greek colonists since about 600 BC. It was conquered by Rome at the end of the 2nd century BC and became the first Roman province outside of Italy. Provence, thousands of years ago, was part of Roman Gaul and because of that the area is filled with Roman remains and colourful pockets of colour. Specifically, the town of Monton, famous for the annual Lemon Festival. For centuries, it formed the border between Provence and Genoa, and was actually Italian until the disputed French vote of 1860 when it was added to France. And it's because of this Italian heritage that you'll find such pungent colours reminiscent of the Cinque Terre, which is a vast contrast to the towering apartment blocks in nearby Monaco and the glamorous Belle Epoque era hotels along the Promenade La Croisette in Cannes. 
Further down the coast sits the Romanesque town of Fréjus, a port town seeped in historical and architectural heritage. The group of Episcopal buildings, including Fréjus Cathedral, were built between the 5th and 16th century, and the baptistry is one of the oldest in France, an example of early Christian architecture. Although, perhaps when we think of classic Provençal architecture, we imagine stone farmhouses and hilltop villages that overlook the mountains. And no town creates this atmosphere better than Saint-Paul-de-Vence, nestled into the hills. The village's beautiful landscape, teemed with its endless art galleries and quirky sculptures, make it an art lover's paradise and an extremely popular tourist destination. The village developed its Baroque religious architecture and in the 19th century, the artists started to arrive, attracted by the light and the beautiful architecture of the village. We actually wandered around the town in the evening, which was lovely because one, the town wasn't crazy, and two, we were able to see the sunset over the Alps, just a perfect way to end the day. After exploring the French Riviera, our trip progressed west to the historic city of Aix-en-Provence. Known as the home of Impressionist painters Cézanne, the prestigious university, and the hundreds of fountains dotted around the centre, hence Aix is called the City of a Thousand Fountains. From 879 until 1486, Provence was a semi-independent state ruled by the Council Provence, and because of that, to this day, the city still keeps a sophisticated appearance. The vibe, however, is very different. We found it to be very laid back, and there's a real alfresco culture there. Aix has all the beauty that Provence has to offer in one place. Great food, good wine, markets, mountain views, and within driving distance to the beautiful lavender fields. Well, we didn't get to see the lavender because it was cut down early because of the heat waves, but I'm sure that would have been amazing too. It's an extremely walkable city, so we decided to walk the main city centre and explore the historic areas in the Old Town, or the AEX. The public squares and courtyards are lined with 17th and 18th century mansions, and the streets are shaded with trees, making it the perfect city to stroll through. If you're looking for a city like Paris that has a relaxed and Mediterranean feel, this is the place for you. The French regional Provence is truly a marvel. It's everything I imagined it to be, but even more in fact. The colours are more vivid, the aromas more intense, and the food more sensational than you can imagine. Needless to say, we will be back and hopefully we'll see the lavender next time. After our adventure in Provence, it was time to head inland to the southwest department of Dordogne, a territory famed for its rural French countryside living. The Dordogne gets its name from the river which cuts through the territory, and is referred to as the Périgord by the French, as that was the former province's name. It's extremely vast, and we only had time to explore the Périgord Noir area, which gets its name from the dark colour of its evergreen oak forests and the abundance of black truffles. The area is now known as a gastronomic epicentre in France, and for its abundance of nature that attracts many hikers and canoers during the summer months. When you arrive in the Vézère Valley, of course nature will blow you away, but the architecture too. The town of sarlat la canada actually holds the record for most medieval buildings per square metre in France, and walking through the town, it really does feel like you're walking in a different time in history. Further down in the pretty village of Bainac sits an imposing castle perched above. Richard the Lionheart, King of England, once walked the halls of the castle, gazing out at his French enemies in Castelnau across the river. The river's edge is lined with a stretch of wonderful stone houses with black roofs, typical of the region. In fact, the town is classified as one of the most beautiful villages in France, and it was one of the filming locations for the 2000s film Chocolat. The picturesque landscape glistens with black stone Lose rooftops. A typical Maison Périgordine has a Lose roof which is slate cut between 3 and 5 centimetres of thickness, giving a very distinctive appearance. However, the greatest characterization of the Dordogne are the limestone facades, making the Dordogne known as the Golden Region. 
The okra colour glows in the sun and lights up the historic walkways within the towns. If you decide to explore this part of France, make sure to explore the caves, scenic riverbanks, authentic towns, and try the signature cuisine the region has to offer for the true French country experience. Picasso, Cézanne, Van Gogh, Renoir, Matisse, we could be here all day long, naming the giants of the fine art world who have all came down here at some point during their active years. Sunrises, sunsets, no matter what moments they have been wanting to immortalize on their canvases, the effortlessly brilliant seascape of the Côte d'Azur turned out to be a great source of inspiration for all of them. If art history is your kind of thing, there are many places where you can see the countless amounts of artworks these masters have left behind for us to see. Museums, collections, even studios of Van Gogh and Renoir are visitable places in the area. There must definitely be something in the air around this place, as wherever we went we felt like we were surrounded by art and design inspiration, and not just in the aforementioned obvious places. Artisan gift shops, quirky sculptures and hand-painted lettering are sprinkled around these regions, streets, shops and restaurants, all coming together to decorate these picturesque towns. It really gives you the impression that people of all ages genuinely care about the legacy and the power of this place. Whilst we were in Sarlet, we went to Atelier Massot, an art studio run by Jean-Francois Massot, which was one of the best, if not the best, gallery we went to. We definitely recommend you to check his paintings out if you are in the Dordogne. Or if you want more info to buy online, we have left his website and contact information in the description box. In the wrong hands, all this design work could easily come across forced or overly commercialized, but since everything is done so tastefully, and with such care, this definitely is not the case here. There is not one street fountain or church window that feels neglected or out of place. You see real signs of craftsmanship wherever you look, which creates a wonderful sense of harmony between the human-made creations and the natural landscape. I know it sounds like we did a lot, and in all honesty we did, and yet there are still so many towns we didn't get the chance to explore. I think my main takeaway is that if you're an artist, designer or architect, or just a lover of all those things, this is truly a place where you can become inspired by the busy towns and cities, but also unwind in the romantic countryside. If you have any questions about visiting the south of France, leave a comment below and I'll help you as best as I can. I hope you enjoyed our travel and design vlog and I will see you in the next video. Bye guys!